It all starts with Musashi, a lad, and his lifelong friend Kajiro. These lads dream of becoming the strongest fighters in a world teeming with strange creatures known as Onis. These beings suddenly appeared 150 years ago and seized control of the land of Hinamoto. Despite some brave fighters like Musashi and Kajiro, who continue to battle to free the people and unite the world. Back in the present, in the ancient land of Hinamoto, human civilization thrived until the year 1568, when an unexpected Kishin emerged, signaling the end of human dominion. The brave generals of the warring states fell one by one, but a handful resisted, refusing to submit to the absolute control of the Kishin. These resilient individuals, known as Bushi, became the last hope against the Oni threat. 151 years have passed since then, and in the city of Tatsuyama, humans have shifted their devotion towards the Kishin, praying for their safety. At the minor training school, Musashi stands out as the top in his class, earning praise from his peers. However, during the history class, most students, including Musashi, view the Bushi as monsters who once ruled Hinomoto, making life difficult for the agricultural class. Aware of the truth, Musashi recalls his childhood and the days when he trained with swords alongside Kojiro. Jisai, Kojiro's father, reveals ancient scrolls that narrate the enduring struggle of the Bushi against the Oni, with the desire to free humanity. Kojiro questions whether a Bushi can truly defeat a giant Kishin, and Musashi understands that this is why many Bushi join the fight. Determined, Musashi chooses to form the strongest Bushi band alongside Kojiro to defeat the Oni and restore freedom to their land. After classes, Musashi visits Kojiro with concerns about his future as a minor as the graduation ceremony approaches. He displays his pickaxe, which he considers his katana against the Oni, and proposes to Kojiro to join him and a band of Bushi to leave the city. However, the proposal is rejected by Kojiro, who reveals that he and his father are descendants of Bushi, ostracized by the people. Kojiro thinks that his father exaggerated the heroism of the Bushi to comfort him, and believes that Musashi too has abandoned his dreams by settling for becoming a minor alongside the common class. Musashi, upset, withdraws, but determined to prove the seriousness of his intentions. Meanwhile, Kojiro reflects on his past remembering how he was mistreated for being a Bushi and wishes to protect Musashi from the same experience. The next day, Musashi's class graduates as minors, but upon entering the mines, they are confronted by Oni. One of them is devoured, and they discover that they will be slaves to the Oni, extracting stones for them until death. Musashi, though already aware of the truth, confronts the Oni courageously, but realizes he forgot his pickaxe outside and is overwhelmed. Upon checking Musashi's forgotten backpack at his home, Kojiro discovers Musashi's true desire to become a Bushi. While Musashi struggles desperately, Kojiro appears with his Kitetsuki, attacking the Oni and saving Musashi. He returns Musashi's pickaxe and book, revealing that Musashi had been practicing with the pickaxe as a sword. Musashi, facing the Oni, admits his self-deception and chooses to embrace his true dream of becoming a Bushi, and with a cut of a thousand turns, he defeats the first Oni. The battle continues, and as they face the Oni, Musashi proposes to Kojiro to form a band together, not out of fear, but because he doesn't want to face the battle alone. Suddenly a light shines from the sky, revealing the appearance of a Kishin. Riding the Kitetsuki, Musashi tears through Oni after Oni. His excitement about finally realizing the dream of forming a Bushi band is evident, but Kojiro does not share his enthusiasm. He longs to leave the city, having forgotten his original desire to be a Bushi and to eliminate the Oni. Musashi is confident that Kojiro will regain his passion. On their way, they encounter the Kishin, but are surprised to see it so diminutive. Musashi manages to easily cut it in two. However, the Kishin regenerates and returns to its original form. Worshipping villagers appear, bringing offerings to the red-colored being. As it devours the offerings, it transforms into an imposing Kishin and Goku Teng, Followers rejoice, as it is the first time in five years that the Kishin assumes its true form. Kojiro and Musashi are knocked down by the Kishin's attack. Seeing Musashi on the ground, Kojiro prepares to fight, but the Kishin snatches his sword away. The worshippers insist he let go, as the Kishin feeds on swords. Kojiro refuses, holding on to it with determination. The Kishin strikes him in an attempt to make him release it, and in that moment, Kojiro recalls his childhood. His father Jisai, taught him that the sword is the pride of a bushi, and he should not be ashamed of it. 
Kojiro clings to the sword, resisting the Kishin's attack. The Kishin finally grasps Kojiro with its finger, tears away his sword, and devours it. Witnessing this, Musashi attacks the Kishin with fury, managing to wound it. After a fierce confrontation, Musashi slips and falls into the open belly of the Kishin. Surprisingly, he emerges with Kojiro's sword, and returns it to him, urging him not to lose it again. Remembering his father's words, Kojiro smiles, and agrees to join Musashi in forming the band. Suddenly, a group of Bushi approaches in a mobile castle. They break through the Kishin's barrier and head towards him. Now Tora Takeda, captain of the Bushi, advises Musashi and Kojiro to seek refuge. Musashi insists that they too are Bushi, and have defeated the Kishin. Nautora points out the Kishin's regeneration, and when the situation becomes serious, Kojiro suggests a retreat. However, Musashi decides to face the challenge, running forward and confronting the Oni with bravery. Doubt about his identity as a Bushi arises among the present warriors, but our protagonist continues to fight with a fierceness that defies expectations. Nautora returns, observing Musashi approaching the Kishin. Despite the confusion, one of Nautora's men notes that it makes sense to save people rather than simply kill Kishin to reclaim the world for humans. Musashi, determined to confront the Kishin, charges forward at full speed while Kojiro chooses to stay behind. Despite Musashi's efforts, his attacks prove ineffective, and Shunrai leads him to Takeda's camp. Irritated by being halted, Musashi yearns to achieve his first victory and take a step closer to realizing his dream. Natora, explaining the nature of the Bushi, prevents him from rushing into the battlefield, pointing out that defeating the Kishin requires the collaboration of many Bushi. Although Musashi acknowledges the challenge, he refuses not to try, fearing regret. Breaking free, he runs back into the battle, and Nautora, recognizing his determination, decides to allow him to continue. The Bushi prepare to attack the Central Horn, but Musashi, slamming the ground and triggering a landslide, disrupts their formation with a technique he calls Kanemaki-style destruction. At that moment, Kojiro reveals to Musashi the weakness of the Kishin, breaking the horn at its navel. While Musashi leaps towards the monster, Kojiro questions the followers and conveys to Musashi the key to victory. However, when attacking the central horn, Musashi's sword shatters. Before the Kishin can counterattack, Natora steps in, praises Musashi's determination, and cuts off the horn, leading to the death of the Kishin. After the Kishin's explosion, the Bushi absorb its power while celebrating. Musashi and Kojiro lament that their first achievement has been overshadowed. Watching the celebration, Kojiro reflects on the truth behind his father's words, and recognizes the Bushi as heroes. Natora informs the villagers that the Bushi will continue to fight against the Kishin to restore safety to the world. However, some Bushi disagree, prioritizing stability over the elimination of the Oni, generating internal conflict in Nautora's mission. The Bushi, bearers of seemingly impossible dreams, pass them down to future generations, growing stronger with each inheritance. Nautora argues that looking at the blue sky without fear is the shared wish of all parents for their children, believing in the eventual victory of their generations. She calls for the collaboration of all, and the Bushi, in a unified chorus, proclaim freedom for Hinomoto in support of Nautora. Kojiro recognizes in Nautora the image of a Bushi as described by his father, while Musashi remains upset that his prey was taken from him. Nautora approaches them, apologizing for taking away their prize, but Kojiro insists that they simply weren't strong enough. Despite the general joy, Musashi erupts in a burst of anger for losing his first prize. Recognizing Musashi's potential, Nautora grants him a crystal as a consolation prize. Although Musashi remains resentful, Nautora withdraws. Later, persisting in his anger, Musashi examines the crystal and discovers that it bears the seal of the Aki province. His fury transforms into curiosity as he realizes that the crystal is, in fact, a kaleidoscope. Kojiro recalls seeing the same pattern in Bushi scrolls and points out a man who also wears it. They discover that the kaleidoscope is a tool for detecting Oni, and now Tora has provided them with a means to locate the next Kishin. Upon further examination of the scroll, they uncover over a hundred names of Kishin, including Engoguteng. As they read on, they realize that the ultimate goal of the Bushi is to unify the land. Musashi rushes into the city and reveals to Nautora that he is fighting to unify the country. 
Now Tora congratulates him for figuring it out, and warns him that battling Oni is not a solitary game. Musashi points out that even the Takeda Bushi haven't achieved this dream, which has remained unfulfilled for 150 years. Determined, Musashi vows to defeat all Kishin and unify the country. The next day, Musashi and Kojiro depart from the city. Musashi expresses his gratitude for meeting Kojiro, and for his father's teachings on swordsmanship, which have provided him with a dream to aspire to, instead of aimlessly breaking rocks. Our protagonists on their journey choose to avoid confrontations, initially enjoying their days. However, after a week without food, tension arises, and Musashi blames Kojiro for the lack of preparation. Kojiro, in turn, accuses Musashi of delegating all responsibilities and mocks his inability to fish, unleashing a conflict between them. Upset, Musashi tries to demonstrate his fishing skills, but fails. At this moment, a young woman named Sugumi appears, distracting Kojiro. Upon Musashi's return, he finds Kojiro injured on the ground. Before he can warn him about Sugumi, she attacks them, immobilizes Musashi, and demands their belongings. Musashi frees himself and confronts Sugumi, revealing his special abilities and immunity to sexual allure. The girl, realizing the time, decides to abandon the fight out of fear of being late for her lord. Subsequently, it is revealed that Sugumi works for Hideo Kosameda, and has stolen the Kitetsuki from the Bushi, following Hideo's instructions. Musashi and Kojiro are not going to allow themselves to be robbed just like that, so they follow the tracks of the Kitetsuki to the Kosameda Bushi fortress. Tsugumi invites them friendly to join her group, revealing that she had only borrowed the Kitetsuki. Despite the warrior's caution, they accept the offer and explore the fortress, discovering that it is essentially a moving village. During their visit, Tsugumi explains that the Bushi castles can move thanks to their inhabitants. As Musashi and Kojiro interact with the people, they are surprised to see normal families among the Bushi. Tsugumi shares her experiences, recalling her sister Tsubami, who taught that Bushi fight to protect the weak. However, Tsubami was murdered, leaving Tsugumi alone with her motivations to join the Kosameda Bushi. Later on, Musashi shares his loneliness with Tsugumi, creating a connection between them. Everyone gathers with Hideo for dinner, where he praises Musashi and Kojiro's Kitetsuki. Hideo proposes an alliance due to the presence of street oni in the area, suggesting that working together could reduce casualties. However, Musashi asks about the nature of the Kitetsu, puzzling Sugumi and Hideo. Realizing Musashi and Kojiro's lack of knowledge, Hideo deems them useless and orders Sugumi to capture them. With her weapons, Sugumi imprisons them and Hideo locks them away, suspecting they might have more hidden Kitetsu. Tsugumi apologizes for her apparent failure, as her mission was to bring powerful Bushi useful to Hideo. In a discussion about defense against Oni and Kitetsu, Tsugumi points out that most of the inhabitants are vulnerable and shouldn't be expected to fight to the death. Contrary to this, Hideo argues that the Bushi were created to face the Oni until the last man. Tension rises and Hideo becomes angry, questioning Tsugumi's perspective. She, fearful, denies objections and asks about her next mission. After calming down, Hideo admits that Tsugumi is useless without him, but promises to always be by her side. After an emotional moment, Tsugumi visits Musashi and Kojiro, asking them again about the Kitetsu. While explaining their lack of knowledge, Tsugumi reveals that it is the iron dust that appears after the death of Akishin and is used by the Bushi to combat the Oni. The girl informs them about a herd of Kodama Oni heading towards the castle, Although Musashi senses that she is hiding something, he decides not to say anything. Unable to fully express her concerns, Tsugumi starts to cry and flees the scene. Our protagonists use their skills to escape from the prison in Kosamita Castle. Despite managing to find their Kitetsuki, they still need to retrieve their weapons. While searching, they spot a large group of Kodama Oni approaching the castle. Hideo alerts Tsugumi about the attack, calling for a total mobilization. However, Tsugumi, recalling Musashi's words, opposes Hideo. Hideo, seemingly distressed, expels her from the gang and the castle, urging her to live alone in the desert if she desires protection. Tsugumi, feeling abandoned and very furious, accepts Hideo's offer. In a moment of reflection in front of a family portrait, Tsugumi recalls her sister's experience and understands her feelings. Although she initially decides to defy Hideo to protect the village, her indecision grows when confronted with the reality of her situation. The arrival of Musashi and Kojiro interrupts this dilemma as they search for their swords. 
Musashi ignores Sugumi's warnings and destroys the portrait, demonstrating that he doesn't adhere to Hideo's decisions. Tsugumi, still believing she is weak without him, is torn. Musashi argues that he defeated Kojiro and possesses superior knowledge about the Oni. Faced with the imminent threat of the Oni, Musashi calls on the girl to join them in the fight. Although initially opposed, Tsugumi agrees to guide them to their weapons. Once armed, he takes them to the plaza where Hideo had gathered the villagers. Tsugumi enlists the help of Musashi and Kojiro to facilitate their escape from the city, while Hideo urges the people to join the fight. Although the villagers are hesitant to confront the Oni, Tsugumi uses smoke bombs and appeals to the Bushi's sense of duty to protect the people. Tsugumi reveals her strategy of buying time by facing the Kodama Oni and hopes that others will escape before asking for help. Although the townspeople initially show reluctance, they accept the reality of the situation and prepare for battle. Tsugumi's moral dilemma is resolved in favor of protecting others, marking a shift in her loyalty and decisions. Suspicious of Tsugumi's unusual attitude, Hideo comments on her sudden change in behavior, wondering if it's part of some plan. However, Musashi and Kojiro have taken advantage of the distraction of the smoke to neutralize the guards. Despite Tsugumi urging everyone to escape, the population remains immobile due to fear of Hideo's threats who warns of deadly consequences for their families in case of desertion. Realizing that fear still controls the people, Tsugumi decides to confront Hideo directly to inspire courage. However, in the confrontation, Tsugumi is quickly defeated by Hideo, who hits her, reminding her that he taught her how to fight and that survival depends on following his orders. Tsugumi, resisting, spits blood in his face and declares her decision to no longer obey. Rising to her feet, both activate their weapons for a decisive showdown. In the battle, Tsugumi realizes that she wasn't afraid of Hideo, but of the fear of being alone after leaving him. Addressing the townspeople, she urges them to fight for their freedom and not succumb to Hideo's control. Tsugumi skillfully dodges Hideo's attacks and ultimately defeats him, throwing him to the ground. With the townspeople liberated, Tsugumi stays behind as Musashi and Kojiro, with the help of their Kitetsuki, managed to capture both Tsugumi and Hideo. They escape just in time before the arrival of the Kodama Oni, which destroys the castle. Tsugumi's sacrifice and the timely intervention of Musashi and Kojiro culminate in the liberation of the village and the defeat of Hideo. The villagers beseech our heroes to help Tsugumi escape from Hideo Kosameda, who, after a betrayal, became obsessed with her. Although Tsugumi initially refuses to leave, the villagers insist on protecting her from Hideo, However, this leads Tsugumi to realize that she must leave the place she holds dear. Ultimately, Tsugumi requests to join Musashi and Kojiro, and they agree. On the night before their departure, Musashi inquires about Tsugumi's decision. She explains her fear of falling once again under Hideo's manipulation and hurting those she loves. Although Tsugumi feels pathetic for not being able to let go of Hideo, Musashi consoles her, drawing parallels with his own bond with Kojiro's father. The next day as they leave, the children of the village beg Tsugumi to return someday, while Musashi decides to seek out a blue kishin with the kaleidoscope. On their journey, Tsugumi questions the usefulness of hunting Oni if no one praises her. Musashi assures her that they will receive praise, but Tsugumi doubts that it would motivate her. A discussion ensues, but Kojiro intervenes, reminding them to get along. Later, Tsugumi becomes affectionate with Musashi, which makes Musashi worry about Kojiro's interpretations. In a reflective moment, Musashi confesses a secret. He has a preference for older women due to experiences in the mining school, where talking to younger girls resulted in punishment, forcing them to focus their attention on the female teachers. Meanwhile, Kojiro observes the close relationship between Musashi and Tsugumi, willing to support them, though feeling some reservations. He grapples internally about revealing his own secret. His stigma as a bushi made him undesirable to girls, and he had never experienced a romantic relationship. Fearing that the miner's popularity might set Musashi apart, he decides to keep his secret. Musashi and Kojiro ponder Tsugumi's intentions, who reveals her desire to be friends with them, something she has never experienced outside her bushi group. She clarifies her previous actions, confessing her lack of experience in friendly relationships, the next morning, an Oni steals Kojiro's sword, prompting Musashi to give chase. Musashi attempts to confront the Oni, but his sword shatters. In that moment, he encounters Shiro Inukai, who allows him to borrow a Kotetsu blade to defeat the Oni. 
Musashi feels intense energy while using the sword, but it breaks after the confrontation. Intrigued by Musashi's ability, Shiro wonders if he is the key to unlocking that power. Shiro and his servant, Nanao Inusaka, mysteriously disappear, leaving Musashi bewildered. When Kojiro and Sugumi appear, Musashi shares his experience, but his friends doubt the reality of the encounter. Although Musashi yearns to wield a Kitetsu blade again, he doesn't fully comprehend its significance. Tsugumi reveals that their weapons are made of Kitetsu, and emphasizes its importance in breaking the horns of Oni. Encouraged by the idea, they decide to explore a commercial market in search of a Kitetsu blade. In the bustling commercial market, Musashi and his fellow Bushi find themselves excited by the presence of numerous Bushi. Tsugumi explains that they are using Kitetsu Sen as currency, and the coveted Kitetsu blades, highlighted main attractions, are usually reserved for the last day. During their meal, Kojiro and Musashi are approached by a curious Bushi about their group, but Kojiro reveals that they haven't decided on a name yet. Tsugumi advises choosing a captain to provide direction for the band, and Musashi suggests Kojiro for the role, arguing that he, even without a surname, would be a suitable choice. Although Kojiro is surprised, he agrees on the condition of fulfilling Musashi's dream. The auction of the coveted Kitetsu blades begins with 25 swords from the Ryuzoji band on display. Faced with a difficult choice, Musashi receives unusual advice from a woman named Mitsuru Osafuni, the leader of the Ryuzoji band. Choose the sword that captivates you at first sight. Our boy is drawn to one, much to Sugumi's displeasure. Meanwhile, Kojiro selects the Vorpal Cherry Blossom sword, seemingly disregarded by others. Mitsuru praises their choices, noting Musashi's ability to choose wisely and the authenticity of Kojiro's selection. After the choices, Mitsuru reveals an important ritual. The auction is a test where the sword chooses its master. As Musashi picks up his sword, he experiences a mysterious aura around him. When Kojiro picks up his sword, he undergoes an intense experience involving a review of his life, and the sword is illuminated with radiant stone wings, indicating his success in the trial. Tsugumi congratulates Kojiro, and he feels a deep connection, describing the sword as an integral part of his being. Others also pass the test, each with a unique glow surrounding their swords, symbolizing the unique connection between the bushi and their kitetsu blade. Mitsuru explains that the vibrant colors of the kitetsu blades reflect the colors of the bushi's souls, and each color provides different powers. Kojiro discovers that the color of his soul is blue, common but desirable and the band aspires to have at least one member with a red soul. Meanwhile, Musashi undergoes the sword's judgment in a dark space. He relives the final moments of Jisai Kanemaki, but fails to hear his words. A woman appears, embraces him, but the trial turns dark, and Musashi fails. Musashi tries with other swords, but none prove successful. Mitsuru reveals that Musashi cannot wield Kitetsu blades, as the color of his soul is rejected by these swords. Musashi vows to train, but Mitsuru suggests he give up being a bushi. Musashi questions the true nature of being a bushi, and recalls the advice of other bushi to be useful in the castle, even if he can't hunt Oni. Upon learning that Kojiro approved of him, Musashi is pleased but faces the dilemma of being unable to confront the Oni. A Kishin appears, sending a lesser Oni. Musashi realizes his powerlessness against the Oni, but Kojiro protects him with his new Kitetsu blade. With his sword, Kojiro defeats an Oni, saving a mother and her child. Musashi realizes that his desire to hunt Oni was to be with Kojiro. While celebrating the victory, Musashi reflects on his inability to fight against these creatures. The focus is on Kishin, and Tsugumi suggests confronting him. However, Musashi realizes that he cannot come and go without Kojiro. He remembers using a Kitetsu blade before, and Shiro appears, revealing to have witnessed his previous test and sharing a similar black aura. Shiro claims that they have things in common and that Musashi belongs to their group. Shiro, with tears in his eyes, expresses his joy at finally meeting the person behind the mysterious black stones in Musashi. He senses that Musashi is seeking to strengthen itself and join its friends. He reveals the way to use the Kitetsu blades by simply accepting the black stones. Shiro shares his experience during the trial, mentioning that a mist appeared and he fainted, but emphasizes the importance of surrendering to the sensation. Intrigued to discover the extent of his strength, Musashi watches as Shiro performs an astonishing cut in the ground with his sword. Surprised, he wonders if Shiro used a Kitetsu blade for such a feat. 
Shiro tosses a Kitetsu blade to him and urges him to surrender, suggesting that he could become the ultimate Kitetsu blade. Understanding that Shiro wants him to transform into a sword, Musashi refuses and affirms his desire to fight alongside his friends. Faced with Musashi's refusal, Shiro suggests the idea of turning Musashi's friends into swords as well, so that he doesn't feel alone. Immediately after, he pushes Musashi along with a Kitetsu blade into the well. Meanwhile, Kojiro, Tsugumi, and the other Bushi head towards the Kishin. Tsugumi questions the decision to leave Musashi behind, but Kojiro explains that they couldn't do anything for him. Instead of discouraging him by saying that someday he might be able to use a Kitetsu blade, they decided to move forward and discover the Kishin's weakness for when Musashi joins them. Tsugumi wonders about Musashi's true identity, considering the strangeness of possessing those black stones. She suggests the possibility that Musashi might be someone special, perhaps from a distinguished family. Kojiro reveals that Musashi's family were farmers, like most in Tatsuyama. Disappointed, Tsugumi listens to Kojiro's story about how he, being the only son of a bushi, became friends with Musashi, as the latter was interested in swordsmanship. Despite the villagers' hostility towards the bushi, Musashi was accepted due to the kindness of his parents, who didn't care about what others would say. Tsugumi is perplexed by the Kitetsu Blade's aversion towards Musashi, considering him to be an ordinary person. Meanwhile, Nanao returns with dinner, and Shiro reveals that he threw Musashi into the well. Saddened by Musashi's kindness, Nanao questions the relationship between him and Shiro. She discovers that Shiro lied to Musashi by claiming they were alike, and that he is seeking the obsidian goddess within Musashi. Nanao realizes that Shiro plans to use Musashi as material for a sword. As Musashi falls, he grabs a sword to avoid the magma, and black stones emerge around him. The goddess within Musashi suggests surrendering and turning into stone, but he uses the stones to climb. However, the goddess tells him they must hide, and more stones grow around him, eventually falling into the magma. Musashi awakens in a strange world, where the goddess urges him to stay with her. Musashi refuses, and expresses his desire to help his friends, but the goddess tells him they don't need him, and makes him recall his past. Our protagonist recalls the death of his parents, and how he was accepted into a new family, with restrictive conditions. Feeling invisible, he desires to be noticed and accepted, leading him to throw a stone at a fellow Bushi to gain recognition. The goddess reveals that Musashi longs to be loved, and that being a Bushi is just an excuse to be with his friend. Apologizing for exposing his past, the goddess seeks to bend his will to fight and avoid capture. Musashi turns into stone, embraced by the goddess, who suggests staying there forever. Meanwhile, Kajiro, Tsugumi, and the Bushi finally reach the Kishin. The Bushi discover the headless Kishin and assume that someone had already taken care of it. Tsugumi insists that it's still alive, as Kishin transforms into Kitetsu upon death, and its horn should be intact. Kojiro approaches to find the weakness, but finding nothing, he speculates that the horn might be on Kishin's head. At that moment, Shiro appears and confirms that the horn is indeed on Kishin's head. The Bushi realized that Shiro was the one who decapitated Kishin, and a group surrounds him, demanding the location of the head to finish off Kishin and obtain the Kitetsu. However, they are easily defeated by Shiro, who reveals that he seeks the Kitetsu blades of the Bushi. Recognizing him as a sword hunter, the remaining Bushi prepare to confront him. Despite their combined efforts, Shiro easily defeats them, and acknowledges Kojiro, suggesting that he will join forces with him. Meanwhile, Musashi turns into a black stone, but the obsidian goddess discovers that Nanao uses her Kitetsu blade to rescue him from the magma. Surprisingly alive, Musashi thanks Nanao and rushes towards the mountaintop. Recalling the goddess's words, Musashi asserts that being a Bushi means more than just being with a friend. After throwing the stone to Jisai, Musashi feels that he should be the one to die instead of Jisai. That night he apologizes to Jisai, and Jisai offers him to stay and live with them, raising him as his own son. As the Bushi attempt to escape, Shiro, enraged, kills the one fleeing, declaring that the souls of the cowardly are dreadful. Having promised to turn Musashi's friends into Kitetsu blades, Shiro pursues Kojiro, who decides to confront him to allow the others to escape. In a dead-end alley, Kojiro attacks Shiro but fails and is easily knocked down. Impressed by Kojiro's bravery, Shiro lifts him up and praises the color of his soul. About to kill him, Shiro stops upon sensing Musashi's presence, 
turning to see him. Musashi, now wielding a Kitetsu blade, approaches with Tsugumi. Shiro withdraws, allowing Musashi and Tsugumi to reunite with Kojiro. Musashi, displaying his inability to use the cold lights, explains that the mist and black stones no longer emerge while he holds the sword. Shiro comments that the blade neither accepts nor rejects him. Nanao, joining Shiro, reveals that she brought Musashi out too soon, and Shiro forgives her because the situation has become interesting. Shiro suggests they observe Musashi, half-merged with the black stone, while Nanao restarts the operation to capture the goddess. Musashi explains that they are being pursued, and Kojiro joins the fight, recalling the importance of fighting for someone. The three prepare to confront Shiro and Nanao. Nanao unleashes her Kitetsu blade, the seven-belled armadillo sword, turning it into seven flying swords. Musashi, realizing that she is not an oni, believes he can harm her with his sword and attacks. The trio attempts to break Nanao's swords, but they are repelled. Musashi suggests breaking the swords, and Kojiro seems to have come up with a plan. Kojiro devises a plan to confront Nanao, who relies on his numerical advantage of seven swords against three opponents. However, Musashi and Tsugumi catch Nanao off guard by stepping back instead of advancing. Nanao wonders if Kojiro is sacrificing himself to allow Musashi to escape. In his attempt to stop Musashi, Nanao is intercepted by Tsugumi and her Kitetsu Blade Whip, who had anticipated the move. Musashi cuts a portion of Nanao's staff, reducing his arsenal to six swords. Meanwhile, Shiro joins the battle and heads towards Musashi. Nanao tries to convince Shiro that she can still fight alone, but Shiro rejects the idea and prefers to fight solo. Shiro activates the ring on her Kitetsu Blade, unleashing a powerful light effect. A cube of light envelops the area, and upon flipping it, numerous bushi fall from the sky. Shiro continues to cut the ground into smaller cubes, separating the weaker bushi and making a disdainful statement about their unity. She regards the weak bushi as insects, and suggests that they need to become stronger if they want to defeat the oni. Musashi and Kojiro disagree with Shiro, but the latter, unable to comprehend their perspective, strikes the ground, causing everyone to start falling. When Musashi falls, time freezes, and the obsidian goddess appears, revealing Shiro and Nanao's conspiracy to kill Musashi and seize his power. The goddess, concerned about Musashi's death, decides to use her power to save him. However, Musashi refuses, expressing his reliance on others to find meaning and strength. The goddess acknowledges his valuable spirit of camaraderie and decides to grant him her power. As time resumes, large black stones appear, absorbing the energy from the swords. The goddess inside Musashi's body takes Shiro's sword, using a black stone to channel the power from all the Kitetsu swords. She disperses Shiro's cube, restoring the mountain to its place and saving those who were falling. Shiro is thrilled to see it, while Tsugumi and Kojiro notice changes in Musashi. The goddess confronts Nanao, showcasing her mastery over sword energy and explaining how those with black stones can control it. Shiro retrieves his sword, and Kojiro acknowledges Musashi's potential invincibility. The goddess reveals her fragile existence and the imminent loss of her power when acting in the material world. She thanks Kojiro for choosing to fight alongside Musashi. Shiro, excited to meet the goddess, asks her to join him, but she refuses. The goddess decides to expel Shiro and Nanao before retiring to rest and absorb the power of the Bushi. She extracts the energy from the Kitetsu blades, emphasizing the importance of unity among the Bushi. As she prepares to attack, Shiro is astonished by the imminent power of the goddess. The obsidian goddess warns Musashi that she will retreat into him and cautions him not to be assassinated by any enemy, as he is her vessel and Jisai died before completing his mission. Musashi questions the connection with Jisai, but the goddess, with no time for explanations, demonstrates her ability in the material world. She gathers energy from the Kitetsu blades and unleashes a powerful attack against Shiro and Nanao, destroying hills in its path. Although Musashi regains control, he feels the intensity of the battle. Kojiro and Tsugumi approach Musashi, celebrating their victory over Shiro. Tsugumi, concerned about the influence of kind girls on Kojiro, notices that Musashi's sword has broken again. Mitsuru explains that the Kitetsu sword breaks when channeling too much energy, indicating Musashi's potential. They discover a hole where Kishin was, while Shiro and Nanao emerge with the captured Kishin, stating that they narrowly escaped thanks to their technique. On the other hand, the Bushi perform a funeral ceremony in memory of those who fell in the battle against Shiro. 
Tsugumi explains the uniqueness of the Kitetsu blades, which retain the feelings of their wielders and are regarded as symbols of Ibushi's life. Kojiro reflects on his father's words on the matter. Tsugumi, however, disagrees, as her swords belong to her deceased sister, rejecting the idea of replacement. Mitsuru invites the group to spend the night at his gang's castle, and Musashi makes a request before saying farewell. The next day, Mitsuru announces that Musashi will undergo the sword test again, choosing the same blade as in his first attempt. Although spectators doubt his success, Kojiro and Tsugumi believe that the goddess is no longer present, and black stones should not appear. Musashi, uncertain about whether the sword symbolizes the Bushi's life, decides to delve deeper into Jisai's legacy and his connection to the swords. He feels that, even though the dead are gone, their belongings are a symbol of their past life. As he takes the sword, it lights up in red, surpassing the test and eliciting excitement and congratulations from everyone. Musashi reveals to Kojiro that during his trial, he saw Jisai and believes that the goddess knew him. He inquires if Jisai mentioned the goddess, but Kojiro only recalls scrolls, a katana, and Kitetsuki. Considering that they only saw Bushi with Kitetsuki outside the city, Kojiro wonders if Jisai had connections with Bushi in other regions. Nanao, on the other hand, describes Jisai as a notorious criminal wanted for harboring the goddess within him. However, if Musashi hosts the goddess, the description does not align. Shiro points out that 15 years have passed, suggesting that the goddess has chosen a new vessel. Surprisingly, Musashi seems to have no knowledge of the goddess. As the Bushi camp comes to an end and the Bushi disperse, Kojiro reflects on his father, regretting not having spoken to him more. With the vast Bushi world ahead of him, he questions whether he will follow the same path. While most Bushi leave, Musashi and Tsugumi wait for Kojiro. Surprisingly, Kojiro returns with provisions and a map, excited about the vastness of Hinomoto. Together, they decide to head east, marking the beginning of their next adventure. Musashi, Kojiro, and Tsugumi push the Kitetsuki through the forest. Due to the heat, Tsugumi complains, causing a disagreement with Kojiro. Musashi suggests taking turns driving the Kitetsuki, and although Kojiro and Tsugumi agree, they plan to unleash it to scare Musashi. However, they are suddenly ambushed by a green Oni from Octopus Jars. Musashi realizes that the Oni has also captured someone else. Strengthened, Musashi draws his sword and prepares to fight. Aiming at the Oni's horn, he launches an attack, defeating the Oni and absorbing its Kitetsu. After rescuing Kojiro and Tsugumi, Musashi discovers that a young woman had also been captured, Princess Michiru Saruwatari. An elderly man approaches, concerned for her, explaining that they are from the Saruwatari Bushi clan under the Usugi Alliance. They are on their way to the port of Harima to participate in a crucial battle. Michiru joins the group, and they travel in her Kitetsuki, resembling a tank. Despite sensing a shift in Michiru's attitude, Musashi tries to break the ice, but the princess appears distant. The group notices a blacked-out area on Michiru's map, and Musashi, attempting to engage in conversation, inquires about its location. Without receiving answers, they discover they are from Bichu, and Lord Wasugi summoned them to defeat Akishin at the port of Harima. Musashi tries to learn about Michiru's fighting style, but she remains silent. Kojiro and Tsugumi discuss the Wasugi Alliance, a network of bushy-friendly gangs. Musashi gets frustrated with his friends for constantly changing the subject while trying to talk to Michiru. Surprised that Musashi remembers her name, Michiru and he tumble off the Kitetsuki down a cliff due to a bumpy road. During the fall, Michiru uses her sword to create a crystal umbrella, astonishing Musashi. As they glide down, Musashi praises Michiru's sword, triggering memories of her father. Michiru reveals that she is shy and usually alone with the elderly man, explaining her reluctance to join the conversation. Our protagonist laughs, breaking the ice. Michiru asks Musashi to accompany her to the south, but he explains that they are headed east. Michiru warns about a Kishin on the map and points out a massive black wall, the Black Kishin, that divided Hinamoto and grew fueled by minerals. The elderly man explains that the Kishin continues to grow, and only the leader of their alliance, Tatsuomi Wasugi can defeat it. Musashi and Kojiro decide to check scrolls about Kishin and discover that Jisai was in the Wasugi gang. At the port of Harima, several Bushi gangs gather. Amano Bushi feels disappointed at being a minor gang. Haruhisa from Shimazu Bushi recalls the significance of the Kishin horn in Awaji for clan leadership. 
Tatsuomi receives reports about the obsidian goddess in the eastern mine of Mimasaka. The eight of obsidian decide to form a plan to ensure the survival of the Kishin and send someone after Musashi, whom he hasn't seen. Wanting to learn more about his father, Kojiro wants to head to the port of Harima to get information from Wasugi. The group prepares to face significant challenges on their journey to the port of Harima, with the fate of the Black Kishin and the Obsidian Goddess intertwined in their mission. Musashi and his group arrive at the port of Harima, where Musashi and Tsugumi experience the ocean for the first time. While playing in the water, they happen to notice the Wasugi emblem on the mobile citadel, Shiryu Castle. They decide to head there to learn more about Kojiro's father. In the citadel, they are halted by Kanatatsu Naoi, who prohibits them from seeing Wasugi before the battle. He also inquires about their affiliation, and Musashi proudly states that they are part of Kanemaki Bushi, but Kanatatsu hasn't heard of them. When Kojiro mentions the Wesugi alliance, the atmosphere becomes tense, and they request the capture of our protagonists. Musashi attacks Akihiro Shimazu, but he is easily knocked down with a single kick. A helicopter arrives at the opportune moment, and everyone bows before the head of the Uesugi family, Naotora Takeda. Musashi greets him, but Naotora doesn't recognize him at first. After clarifying the misunderstanding, they discover Naotora's significance as the leader of the largest Bushi gang, and one of the five great generals. Kanatatsu attempts to stop Musashi, Kojiro, and Tsugumi, but Naotora reveals that they work for him. Despite this, Naotora does not allow Musashi to join the meeting with Wesugi. Naotora meets with Tatsuomi Wesugi, where Kanatatsu suggests killing the outsiders, but Naotora pardons them, introducing them as second cousins of his older brother. Tatsuomi, interested in Naotora's assistance to confront the Kishin of Awaji, agrees to forgive the gang. Meanwhile, on Awaji Island, Yataro Inuda faces the Green Knight, Yamata no Orochi, and vows to destroy the Usugi gang from within to serve the Kishin of Awaji. On the other hand, our protagonists encounter Shunrai and Aoshi, who prevent them from meeting Tatsuomi Wesugi, as they distrust outsiders. Musashi seeks information about Kojiro's father, but Shunrai questions how it will benefit the Wesugi. Aoshi warns about the danger of confronting Yamada no Orochi, one of the four Kishin. Shunrai explains the necessity of eliminating the descendants of the Black Kishin. Upon arriving at Shiryu Castle, our protagonist wants to learn more about Kojiro's father and asks Sugumi to lift him over the wall. Upon reaching the top, he is impressed by the size of the castle and notices Tatsuomi standing beside him without recognizing him. Tatsuomi, the leader of the Wasugi, praises the castle and the bravery of the Bushi. Musashi discloses his age and Tatsuomi expresses concern as he wishes to prevent the young Bushi from dying senselessly. Soon, Kanatatsu appears and reveals Tatsuomi's identity, surprising Musashi. Our guys are taken to the headquarters for entering illegally. Musashi separates and ends up in a room with other Bushi. He observes tensions between factions and the rivalry between Katsumi Amako and Akihiro Shimazu. Michiru Saruwatari approaches Musashi, concerned about the upcoming battle. Two female Bushi wish for someone else to be the commander, and Musashi decides to join the contest. A three-way fight ensues between Musashi, Katsumi, and Akihiro. Musashi blocks the attacks, showcasing skill. The fight intensifies as Katsumi and Akihiro try to eliminate the weaker opponent first, but Musashi defends himself against their assaults. Musashi, eager to test his skills, faces off against the samurai Katsumi and successfully parries his triple draw attack, leaving everyone astonished. Under the orders of Haruhisa Shimazu, Akihiro is instructed to defeat both Musashi and Katsumi. Using his Kitetsu sword, Akihiro effortlessly separates the two warriors, ultimately defeating our protagonist, who gracefully accepts his defeat. However, Katsumi is determined to continue the fight. Musashi intervenes and calls for reconciliation, accepting Akihiro as their leader. Akihiro is surprised that Musashi wants to be friends, considering it a selfish act to improve his position within the unit. During a strategic meeting, Akihiro briefs his unit on their upcoming mission on Awaji Island, imposing blind obedience to his orders in the Shimazu style. Musashi, questioning authority, argues against following orders without questioning them, recounting his experiences with the Oni as supposed saviors. Akihiro dismisses the dissenters, and Musashi, disappointed by the lack of support, is glad to still have Kojiro and Sugumi by his side, 
as he watches the unit enjoy themselves. The next day, Akihiro assigns roles to the unit, emphasizing that their duty is to immobilize the Oni so that Shimazu can kill them. Despite Musashi's objections about seeking all the credit, Akihiro asserts that it's the way they operate. While carrying out routine tasks, Musashi becomes frustrated as he observes everyone aligning with Akihiro's ideas but refuses to back down. However, Kijinosuke Noguchi approaches him, expressing support. Kanatatsu, the commander of the 1st Division, reveals the strategic plan to lure the rampaging Oni in Awaji to a central location. During the mission, Musashi attempts to stand out, but his sword bounces off the Oni's resilient horns. On the other hand, Kanatatsu showcases his skill by cutting through the horns and reveals his reputation as one of the strongest bushi. Despite the lack of recognition, Kanatatsu focuses on precise records and leads effectively, demonstrating his strength by cutting Oni horns in a single strike. Disappointed by the lack of attention, Musashi realizes he underestimated the unit and the determination of his comrades. Akihiro also displays his abilities by cutting an Oni horn, while our protagonist reflects on the necessity of teamwork and acknowledges that he made a mistake. Tatsuomi informs Naotora about the advance on the island, revealing the location of the obsidian goddess. They fear an infiltrator and anticipate an attack from Yamada no Orochi. Naotora decides to go in search of reinforcements. Meanwhile, at the camp, tensions rise among the units, especially Natsuki. Frustrated by the attention Akihiro receives, Musashi, feeling down, considers fleeing but is comforted by Katsumi, who shares her own story and inspires him to face his fears. Katsumi reveals her connection to Awaji and her desire to reclaim the island. Motivated, Musashi decides to stay and train. The team discovers the absence of a member from the initial deployment, our protagonist, but he returns, determined to become stronger. The next day, Musashi begins his training with Katsumi, determined to overcome his limitations. Yataro urges Michiru to fulfill her mission of finding the host of the obsidian goddess, Musashi, and killing him. Although Michiru is determined, she recalls how Yataro scorned her before discovering her worth as a bearer of a Kitetsu blade. While watching Musashi train, Michiru wishes to protect him despite her duty. Musashi asks Michiru to connect with blade energy, revealing black crystals indicating their connection. Kuroko attempts to capture them, but Michiru and Musashi return to normalcy. Tatsuomi announces the presence of a spy, pointing to Musashi, who is then crucified. Michiru vows to save him and communicates with Yataro, while Kuroko devises a plan to use Michiru as bait. Kanatatsu congratulates Kuroko on the plan to let Michiru go, as she will lead them to the enemy base. The Bushi prepare to attack Awaji. Tatsuomi reveals that they will face Yamata no Orochi, whose defensive barrier can reflect attacks, but by breaking the horns on its heads, it will perish. The reward for breaking a horn is a fortress of their own. Musashi and Michiru, under suspicion, must clarify their situation before joining the battle. Shimazu, excited, stays at the castle, while Haruhisa insists on proving the innocence of Musashi and Michiru. Yataro informs Seiroku that he has located the obsidian goddess in the midst of the Wesugi army. Seiroku suggests a plan. He and Shiro will attack the Wesugi Bushi, while Yataro focuses on securing the goddess. Yataro reveals that one of his daughters was the one who found the goddess, impressing Seiroku. Meanwhile, Michiru manages to free our lad. Later, Akihiro appears and threatens Musashi with his sword at Musashi's neck, telling him to confess everything about himself to the superiors and prove that he has nothing to do with the Shimazu. Musashi realizes that Akihiro is serious and wonders what happened to him. Akihiro recalls a conversation among the other Shimazu, where his father decided to make the son of his concubine his successor, even though he can't even use the Kitetsu blade. Haruhisa also speculates that his father plans to kill them all during the operation on Awaji Island. Three Oni arrive to help their older sister recover the goddess. They discover that Michiru was acting and planning to betray Musashi. Michiru confirms the betrayal, and crystals grow on the young Michiru. Then her father appears, telling her to finish the mission and come back. While the Oni urge her to kill him, one of the Oni, Minami, grabs Michiru and pushes her towards Musashi to stab him. However, Musashi dodges and cuts off the Oni's fingers. Musashi then takes Michiru's hand and pulls her, telling her that it's not wrong for her family to care about her. Angry at the betrayal, the Oni leap towards them, and Michiru uses her body to shield Musashi. 
While the Oni were devouring Michiru, Kuroko, Kanatatsu, Masaki, and other Bushi arrive, cutting down the Oni and saving Michiru. The Oni are stopped by other Bushi, and Kuroko ties up Michiru to stop her bleeding. Musashi questions why Kuroko is helping them, and she simply wishes to be their friend. Kanatatsu and other Bushi fight against the Oni, but three Oni survive and merge Minami and Iwanami. The new larger Oni threatens to devour the city. Tatsuomi Wasugi arrives, and with the energy of the Bushi, enhances his physical properties to confront the Oni. Tatsuomi demonstrates that the yellow Kitetsu blades can alter the properties of energy. Despite attacking his own men, Tatsuomi explains that he finds joy in sharing and being shared, as well as in demonstrating strength and worthiness. The Wasugi Bushi, enhanced by Tatsuomi, overpower the Oni. Minami tries to attack Tatsuomi, but the special bond between Wasugi and the Bushi limits him. Kanatatsu breaks Minami's horn and kills him. Kuroko wonders how the Oni overcame the protective barrier around the castle, and Tatsuomi shares the surprise. Shiro reveals that he allowed the Oni entry with his sword. Wesugi Bushi achieves victory, but Akihiro feels disappointed with his performance. Kuroko explains that only those who have trained together can join the sword's energy chain, and Akihiro must return to his squad. Shiro appears with Tatsuomi Wasugi's Kitetsu blade, easily deflecting Kanatatsu's attacks. Meanwhile, Kojiro and Sugumi search for Musashi's sword. The Wasugi Bushi attempt to form a sword energy chain against Shiro, but he forcefully severs the connection, infecting one of the Bushi. Seiroku Inukawa appears and warns Shiro about revealing allied techniques. Shiro confronts Musashi, noting his uniqueness. He employs a technique to send Musashi and Michiru to Awaji Island, exchanging them for a head of Yamada no Orochi. On the island, Musashi and Michiru find themselves in the heart of Awaji. Yataro plans to kill Musashi to obtain the goddess, but Musashi inquires about Jisai Kanemaki, unknown to Yataro. Michiru awakens and pleads with her father not to kill Musashi. Yataro admires her passion for research and decides not to kill Musashi if Michiru can find a way to obtain the goddess. Musashi pushes Yataro when he draws his sword, and Yataro turns Michiru into stone and bids farewell. Meanwhile, the Wesugi Bushi face difficulties against the enemy. Seiroku cuts Kanatatsu's dragon tattoo, showing disdain. Yataro reveals that Michiru is an Oni child and explains her origin. Failing to meet expectations, he turns her into stone. Musashi objects and defends Michiru, but Yataro restores her, though she no longer recognizes Musashi. Yataro reveals he needs her body, not her feelings, infuriating Musashi, who attempts to attack him unsuccessfully. Michiru, transformed into a puppet, supports Yataro without recognizing our protagonist. Helpless, he confronts Yataro's anger, who is about to kill him. However, Michiru, with some memories intact, stabs her father with crystals growing from her body. Yataro, furious, vows to erase her emotions until she stops defying him. Meanwhile, Shiro, bored, awaits something interesting, and Nautora Takeda arrives looking for Tatsuomi. After a brief confrontation, Seiroku intervenes and swaps places with Musashi. Musashi wakes up alongside Kojiro and Sugumi the next day, some bushi desert after Wasugi's defeat. Kanatatsu seeks Musashi's help and the power of the goddess to confront Kishin, as time is running out. Musashi and his group, accompanied by Kanatatsu, remain determined to assist the Wasugi. Along the way, Kojiro reveals that they initially joined the Wasugi to learn more about Musashi's father, but given the dangerous circumstances, they offer Musashi and Sugumi the option to withdraw. Kanatatsu notices the Kitetsu sword in Sugumi's possession, which turns out to be the same one stolen from the execution grounds. Kojiro and Sugumi explain that they intended to rescue Musashi as their friend. Kanatatsu, observing the strong bond between them, decides to also save their friends, but to do so, they must defeat Akishin and the Bushi. Musashi reveals his desire to save Michiru, and explains that his motivations now extend beyond just his father. Finally, the group reaches the Wasugi. In a dark era, an enigmatic woman, the Obsidian Goddess, bestowed the first Kitetsu blade upon the world. Her soul persists, and Kanatatsu mentions that those who harbor her spirit possess latent power. He opens a chest rumored to unlock the goddess's power, revealing a chalice containing the blood of the goddess. Musashi, initially hesitant, agrees to drink it to strengthen himself against the enemies, the aid of Obsidian, who wield Kitetsu blades and have been allied with the Oni. After consuming the blood, 
Musashi perceives no immediate changes. But upon leaving the mausoleum, hundreds of Kitetsu blades float and converge towards him. Meanwhile, Kuroko Usami devises a plan to confront Yamata no Orochi, save Tatsuomi Wasugi, and simultaneously defeat the Eight of Obsidian. The first mission is assigned to the initial Wasugi deployment, dressed in white, tasked with eliminating 10,000 Oni with carved mouths. The second deployment, Takeda Reinforcements, is to break Orochi's horns instead of the black-clad Wasugi soldiers. The third deployment, the Wasugi soldiers, remains in the castle due to their sword's energy being blocked. They have three days to accomplish this, or Orochi will return the consumed minerals to the Black Kishin, dividing Hinomoto. Seiroku, Shiro, and Yataro, informed through a spy, outline their strategy to defend Orochi for three days and ensure victory. Musashi reunites with his squadron, and everyone is delighted to see him. It is reported that the fighters from Sarawatari have left, while the Shimazu have been ordered to stay. Musashi, revealing that he knows everyone by their names, understands the significance of the unity among the Bushi. Recognizing the inability of a Bushi to fight alone, he expresses his interest in learning more about his comrades. Kuroko assigns them a task. Meanwhile, Kojiro recalls having asked Kanatatsu about his father, but without obtaining any information. Kanatatsu suggests consulting Tatsuomi, as his signature is on the document. Now Tora disagrees with Kuroko's plan, arguing that they should focus on rescuing their leader, not on killing the Kishin. She warns that Takeda Bushi will not join if they insist on the offensive approach. In the battle, Orochi threatens anyone who challenges him. Kuroko exploits the distraction by destroying ships to lure Orochi into attacking the coast. Musashi's group swims around the Oni undetected. They encounter an Oni set up by Seiroku, but Shimazu joins them and easily defeats it. Takeda forces join the battle, following Kuroko's plan. Yataro informs Seiroku, who is surprised to learn that Takeda Bushi is safe. Seiroku expresses disbelief, and Kuroko reveals that it's because her spies provided false information. Seiroku doubts this, stating that Kuroko knows all her spies. Kuroko explains that she knew the moment her men hesitated to step on the flag with the Uesugi clan emblem. Seiroku can't believe she was deceived into being where they wanted her, but she doesn't think Wesugi would leave anyone capable of challenging him. Kanatatsu then arrives and attacks Seiroku, and Kuroko mentions that they just need to break her Kitetsu blade to undo the energy block. Nao and Tatsuomi are engaged in a conversation. Tatsuomi declares himself as the most powerful member of the Uesugi band. Tatsuomi requests Naoe that if the band is in danger, he will take charge. Blind, Naoe swings his sword in any direction, but his enemy approaches from behind and begins to burn his skin with a special power effortlessly. Gradually, he fractures all parts of Nao's body, including the hands that wield his sword. He falls to the ground, completely wounded. The enemy removes the blindness so that he can see his allies being killed. Despite being practically defeated, Nao gets up and grabs his sword with his broken hands. Thanks to using his red sword on himself, our hero was able to break the seal of the sutures, leaving Inukawa, who believed he had won the battle, impressed. Both start to fight, and Inukawa demonstrates how skilled he is with his sword, delivering multiple cuts to the young man. Their weapons clash, and Inukawa's face shows confidence, while Nao continues to lose blood from the cuts. The enemy is about to deliver the final blow to Nao, but suddenly the allies have arrived. Despite this, the sword pierces someone's skin. The beginning flashback continues. A young Naoe reflects on his weaknesses and doubts about whether he can take charge of the Wesugi band. Tatsuomi replies that those leading a realm must act as strong individuals in front of their allies. This determination-filled lesson inspires the young Naoe. Now, his hand is pierced by the enemy's sword. Our hero thrusts his sword into Inukawa's chest. Naoe won this tough battle. In a room, one of the subordinates informs Kuroko that Naoe has won the battle. There are still two formidable enemies to overcome in order to fulfill this mission, and that's why the Takeda and another unit are sent to confront them. Meanwhile, the 5,000 white robes will be responsible for rescuing Lord Tatsuomi. Takeda is about to face a challenging battle against his Inukai. Our heroes have trapped him in a large green barrier, but his enemy is determined to win the battle. The young man loses patience with his opponent. He activates the power Kitsuto Mumyo, and suddenly everyone finds themselves in the depths of the sea. Although it seems all is lost, the band captain destroys that giant water cube and saves them all. Takeda cannot understand the incredible power that his opponent possesses. Inukai explains that he is a white sword, 
one of the strongest warriors of all. A tough fight awaits him. The battle rages on, and his allies believe that the captain is on the verge of losing. Despite facing such a formidable opponent, Takeda wants to prove that the blue swords are the strongest. Suddenly, the enemy summons a giant cube of lava, created to be launched against our hero. But water solidifies this incredible power instantly. In a moment when Inukai is distracted, listening to the story of one of the allies, Takeda summons a fire tiger and a water tiger to send directly towards the enemy with the white sword. Despite this power pushing the enemy back, in a second, he effortlessly cuts both summonings into pieces, leaving the allies breathless. Inukai suggests taking the fight to another location, and they are both automatically teleported. The enemy tries to weaken Takeda's morale, suggesting that he merely copies the abilities of the Kishin. The blue swordsman steps back and attempts to combine fire and water in the palm of his hand. He gathers a power that, if activated, could endanger his allies, but here he can use it freely. He remembers that it was Inukai himself who killed his brother in battle, and now, after much training, he swears revenge. In an unexpected moment for the enemy, he is swiftly pierced with Takeda's weapon, and a massive explosion destroys the battleground where they both convened. The hero emerges from the dust, surviving and surprising his group of allies. The battle has been won, at least for now. He explains that he hasn't defeated him entirely, but has destroyed his Kitetsudo. At the same time, the other heroes continue to fight against a powerful enemy. They manage to defeat several monsters, despite not receiving much help from their allies. Musashi recalls how he lost to Michiru's father, and with determination, though not stronger, will try to become so for the next encounter. Everyone, although seemingly weak, begins to fight against the formidable monsters as a team. Later they arrive at the enemy's lair, where Mishiro is apparently held captive. She suddenly feels that presence but decides to dismiss that feeling. She approaches her father, who explains that she must protect the gods at all costs. She suffers from her father's rejection, and also from a memory she doesn't want to bring to mind. Her father shows her something that will give him a lot of power, and leaves his daughter stunned. Inside the cave, the heroes decide to go their separate ways, as some are only seeking the glory of cutting off the Kishin's horns, regardless of anything else. Despite the apathy of his comrades, Musashi acknowledges that he is not very strong, but appreciates their company, and in fact, remembers each one's name, changing the perspective of his allies. On the way, they encounter an enemy Bushi. The allies number a hundred, and the enemy is only one, but it won't be such a simple battle because this enemy has merged with the Kishin, sacrificing his daughters to accomplish this task. Everyone is astonished by the immensity of the powerful enemy before them. Not only do they face that threat, but the sacrificed daughters also become objects to kill those who threaten their father. Despite the fear, the allies advance, but are instantly eliminated by Musashi. Although some tremble with fear, the Shimazu move forward to fight against this monster, in their mission to defeat the Kishin. This faction advances and begins to attack with their powers, although they cannot execute any because the enemy halts the chain of attacks. An ally is about to die, but Musashi saves him in time. Despite his allies' warnings and the possibility of facing certain death, Musashi decides to fight against the enemy. Meanwhile, the Shimazu try to connect the Toki, but they fail as the enemy raises walls to prevent it. All is not lost. Thanks to Musashi's efforts to destroy the swords, now the allies can connect the Toki without obstacles. His allies are impressed, believing that our hero did not plan this strategy, but it turned out quite well. The Kishin realizes how Musashi is ruining his plans and attacks, leaving him on the ground. This time, his attacks against the Shimazu are more intense. On this occasion, Natsuki is surrounded and about to die at the hands of the enemy, but unexpectedly, our hero appears to save him, even while being severely injured. Every time the enemy tries to prevent the Toki connection, the young hero intervenes to help. Upon completing the chain of six, Akihiro attempts to deliver the final blow to the monster's head, rendering it unconscious. Everyone is tired, and part of the team thanks Musashi for his efforts. While Naoi and Takeda discuss what happened, apparently, the monster is seeking revenge, turning white. They speculate that the serpent absorbs minerals from the Yura mine. Setting aside his pride, one of the Shimazu members admits that Musashi is not useless. The group tries to create a strategy to connect a chain of eight, and finally, everyone discusses without conflicts, except for Akihiro, who remains distant because the others do not take the situation seriously and laugh. 
His teammate blames him for having double standards, as Akihiro didn't really try to defend his allies from certain death. He admits that he only uses his comrades as pawns, and one of them hits him, causing him to leave the team. In vain, they try to attack the serpent to stop it, but they fail. So now Musashi has to take Akihiro's place. Akihiro intervenes in the chain to stop it. In his quest for glory, he hinders the allies' plans to break the enemy's horn. In a childhood flashback, Akihiro explains that he doesn't want to be the one to cut the monster's horn, but rather to pledge loyalty to his brother making the situation even more confusing. Akihiro, on his own initiative, effectively attacks the monster, leaving his allies surprised. It seems strange to everyone that Akihiro now seeks glory, as he didn't care about it when they were children. Apparently, the sword test and battlefield experience changed his perspective. In a flashback during the sword test, Akihiro passes the trial. His father names him as the successor, but the young man refuses, as that title belongs to Haruhisa, his brother. Faced with his son's refusal to be the leader, his father humiliates Haruhisa by naming him inferior to Akihiro, making him the new leader of the Shimazu. His elder brother suffers from not being able to attain the power he sought, but he can do nothing about it, and both their destinies are marked. His allies interrupt Haruhisa's memories to continue with the plan. Despite multiple attacks, they fail to break the monster's horn. If things continue this way, the creature will reach the summit. Akihiro orders that this time everyone connects the Toki, as otherwise, they won't be able to defeat the enemy. Everyone thinks he's crazy, but as the leader of the Shimazu band, they all obey him. With determination, the young man ascends to attack the enemy after the others have connected the Toki. When he is about to reach the summit to launch the attack, a monster opens its mouth, and Akihiro disappears from the scene. His allies lament what happened with tears. The Toki remains connected, so our hero could still be alive, but the other allies declare a retreat to avoid further massacre. Musashi reprimands Haruhisa for not defending his brother, but he reveals that he actually hates him and admits that he wants to be the leader of their band. Meanwhile, Akihiro is inside the monster. He is beaten and pinned against the wall, but to his surprise, his brother comes to help him. The two brothers argue, as Haruhisa is bothered that his brother doesn't trust his teammates. Akihiro denies this, but explains that he cannot lead the victory and be aware of his team at the same time, as that is not the role of a red bushi. For the first time, his brother understands. His teammates hear this conversation, help him up, and motivate him. Now the goal is to connect the toki. They quickly try to make the connection between everyone. Being so exhausted, Akihiro cannot deliver the final blow. Musashi suggests that he can do it, but Akihiro's pride prevents the heroes from implementing this strategy. Thanks to a childhood memory, Akihiro becomes determined and decides to carry out his strategy. He quickly approaches the enemy and with a powerful attack, manages to destroy the Kishin's horn. Allies celebrate this victory and Naue orders the others to destroy the remaining eight horns. They connect the Toki and successfully defeat the gigantic monster. Upon its death, it releases a large amount of Kitetsu and the allies absorb this power. Akihiro finally achieves the glory he sought and shares it with his brother. He also thanks Musashi for returning the token he threw earlier and vows to repay the favor someday. Another mission remains unfulfilled, as they must rescue the Lord. The heroes do their best to face these giant monsters. Despite their efforts, even more enemies appear to confront them. Suddenly, an earthquake occurs. From outside, everyone observes the tremors, and Nao, still badly injured, wants to rush to rescue his lord. Although some try to stop him, Musashi, with determination, runs to meet his allies who are still captive. Although it seems that all is lost, they manage to escape from that mountain alive, saving an ally who was thought to be lost. The heroes gather and feel relieved. It's not time to stop yet, as Musashi still has to rescue Michiru. When they descend the mountain, they come across a black sword ascending to the sky, and a demonic face makes its presence known. Michiru is now captive in the sword held by this monster, who is part of the Black Brothers. Without saying a word, he decides to attack first, and his power is impressive. The other allies go on guard and decide to attack, but this enemy damages everyone at once with a single strike. This monster laughs and congratulates Michiru for merging with him, her father, but Musashi confronts him in close combat. This battle will be tough, as the enemy has the power to absorb the Toki of the allies. The obsidian goddess makes her presence known, 
and the enemy releases a power that destroys seas and the Shiryu castle. Again, invoking the power of the sword, he begins to ruthlessly defeat even more enemies. Musashi can't believe that it's Michiru participating in this massacre. She becomes conflicted. When she remembers our hero, the sword weakens. Although she must defeat him, her memories emerge, causing confusion within herself. The enemy is about to deliver a mortal blow to our hero, but Takeda intervenes in time. The protagonists unite to confront this formidable enemy. Despite their efforts, both are wounded within seconds. Without hesitation, the enemy also attacks other allies, leaving traces of blood in his wake. At one point, the attack is directed towards Musashi, but it is Kojiro who stops the blow. Everything around Musashi freezes. Suddenly a portal opens, and Michiru doesn't want to remember our hero. He decides to enter the portal. Now both are small, and he tries to convince her to remember everything they experienced together. Painful memories of her father abandoning her afflict her heart. Musashi explains that he feels the same way, and she empathizes with him and approaches. She remembers that she loves him, and wants to spend more time with him, even if the hole in her heart doesn't disappear. Our hero invites her to leave that place, and she agrees. Now both are adults, and she is determined not to be a mere tool of her father, but for now, she cannot break that spell. Many doors are presented to them. Now Musashi's mission will be to drink the blood of a goddess to have enough power to confront this powerful enemy. Time has returned to normal, and for a brief moment, our heroes are saved. Now Musashi has the appearance and power of a god, emanating an unparalleled strength. The battle begins between these two adversaries. Musashi's arm detaches along with his sword. The enemy is about to annihilate him, but he stops the sword with just one finger, as the toki of all his allies concentrates in the young man's body. With only one arm, he begins to attack his nemesis and leaves him defeated on the ground. A dark stone detaches from Mikiru's father, and she asks our hero to destroy it. Before this happens, she asks for a moment alone with her father. Both enter a threshold and see her father. She tries to talk to him but he remains as cruel as before, and she decides it's time to break the dark stone since reasoning with her dad is impossible. Her dad explains that she is half-human, so she can be saved. A fate she won't share with her evil progenitor. She begins to express her true feelings for him and forgives him because he is still her father. These words touch his heart, who now looks Mikuru in the eyes, something he had never done before. Thanks to this, she is finally freed from her afflictions, and both she and Musashi return to reality. She thanks him for encouraging her to face her weaknesses. Fortunately, those who were injured have been healed. Half a month has passed since these harsh events. Musashi and his companion converse, and the latter thanks him for what he has done for everyone. On the other hand, Michiru is imprisoned but safe. A ceremony was held to honor those who participated in the tough battle. All factions spend time together, although conflicts and misunderstandings occur among the different groups. Kuroko approaches our heroes and explains that the fight is not over yet, but they hold this celebration as a brief pause. In the city, Michiru meets Musashi. Thanks to him requesting as a favor to release her for just one day, now both can spend the day together. They attend a theater, eat together on the street, play together, and spend time in a boat. The protagonist explains to the others that he is now a member of the Bushi Kanemaki band, leaving everyone perplexed. It is formed by him, Kojiro, and Tsugumi, recognized by Tatsuomi. Michiru congratulates him for this achievement. They come across a couple, and the girl gives them the idea to get rings that will bind them forever. In a store, they buy silver-colored rings, and then they walk hand in hand through the forest. She wishes it could be forever, even though a part of her cheek breaks. The lovers stand before a sunset, and Musashi has a gift for Mikuru. It is a sword that belonged to her. They share a final hug, until she fades away. The hero laments, but the goddess encourages him to learn the truth. The end! Thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon to get new anime recaps.